Welcome, everybody, <coughs> to our uh, March 10th um, City Commission meeting. <laughs> Sorry. Excuse me. At least I, it wasn't the gavel. I was knocking over Gimpy's cane over here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to put it right here. Uh, my apologies. Um, okay, well, uh, uh, Nikki, would you lead us in the invocation and the pledge? And I turned on my microphone this time. As we begin this meeting, let us all take a moment to reflect together, each according to our own individual beliefs and intentions, and offer a moment of silence for all people in peril, especially those suffering through the attacks on Ukraine. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> okay. <coughs> all right, we're going to um, hold off on our presentation first. For a minute, because we're waiting on somebody to arrive. So um, I'm going to jump to citizen input. Is there any citizen input for items not already on the agenda that anybody would like to come forward and talk about? Come on down. Give us your name and address for the record right here. And then there's a clock above my head. Love that shirt. <laughs> it's good to Can see you all again. For three minutes. <laughs> Can we get your name and address for the record? Dale please? Cox, 647 Broadway, 316 Albert Street. And before I start, <clears throat> I want to let you all know that I know that sitting at the head of the spear is not an easy job. It's a thankless job. And I want to thank you for your contributions to the city. Thank you. I mean that sincerely. <clears throat> Last year, I stood before you and voiced my concerns about being a newbie and witnessing what I felt was the deterioration <clears throat> of what I felt the city of Dunedin held so dear. And that was the historic residential area. And <clears throat> at that time, I witnessed things that were happening in the historic residential that in my world were questionable. Shortly after I met with you folks, you imposed an overlay which indicated to me that you also shared my concerns. <clears throat> and since that time, there's been a lot of misunderstanding that I've picked up. There's been a lot of controversy. And there's been a lot of people that have under, tried to undermine um, the hard work that's been done by your consultants and by you folks representing the city. I stand here <clears throat> to let you know that I feel that you're on the right track. That as we speak, there's a group of people, how large, I don't know, that are undermining what you folks have worked so hard to put together. And <clears throat> Everybody has their rights to sit back and voice their opinion. I know and understand property rights. I know and understand what some of these people are concerned about. However, where you folks are headed with this overlay is in the right direction. What we have here in Dunedin is a success story. Wrap it up real quick. That people throughout the state and throughout the country 
would wish to emulate. It's at risk. It's at risk by people that want to be successful and want nice. What we have here is a success story and we have nice. And everybody wants a piece of that. And unfortunately, it revolves around profit and profit. Thank you, Joe. Thank you very much. Keep the course. Thank you. Thank you. Come on in. You can give it right to Rebecca. Just give us your name and address for the record. And sure. The so, good evening. My name's Megan Doherty, and I live at 227 Broadway. And um, I'm just passing around a picture of my house, which was built in 1926, and the current construction that's going up right next to it, so you can have a little sense of the scale that's going up right next to me. And I think you might be surprised on my thoughts. I'm here to share my experience and, and any effort to be a part of a solution. Um, because I, again, thank you for your service. Um, I shared last time I grew up here. My mom was a merchant in the early 90s and was a part of what made Dunedin Dunedin. And I've been here for 30 years. And um, two doors down from me south, they've just finally finished a six, another 6,000 square foot house. At the end, right at Bell Trees, there's of course my phone. No one calls me, but right now. <laughs> um, at, right down at Bell Trees and Broadway is another house. And I've honestly witnessed Good building and bad building. Mindful of the residents and no respect for the residents. And so what I want to share is just to address a couple of things that the city wrote. I attended the meeting of, about the historical overlay. And I honestly didn't even know about the historical overlay until like three months ago. I didn't know about it. Somebody who moved was telling me about it. So first of all, with regards to code compliance, I understand that there's two positions open and that it's hard to find people. I have no idea how to run a city, but I also see there's $700,000 in office equipment being bought. I want to know who represents the residents, the residents that live here year round, the residents who do not make a profit, that do not own a bar, that do not have multi-zoned properties. Respectfully, that Albert Street that everybody was yelling at, it's multi-zoned. I am in a single zoned neighborhood. And now, um, and I, you know, and I want to say one more thing about that. I can't Airbnb it. I am right behind a restaurant that plays live music, the Hale Center, and the Dunedin baseball thingy. <laughs> um, I would love to be able to Airbnb it if I want to move. And with respect to the character overlay, I feel like it's too late. I feel like now with the cost of prices of houses, this began in 09. We could all do the math and see where our property prices were in 09. But now I should be able to build a huge mountain and charge a million dollars for it. You know, I don't know what the answer is, and I'm not here to scream or say anything except my experience. It's affecting my health. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wish to come forward on any item that's not already on the agenda? Um, anything you wanted to say? Not really, Mayor. No, I, I gave you an update on the overlay on Tuesday. I can do that today if you'd like, given that we have folks in here, but it, it's up to you. Why don't you do that? Okay, sure. Um, so the the character overlay itself, and I appreciate your, your comments, Dale. Um, the character overlay itself is a citizen-initiated initi work effort. The, uh, the zoning in progress, not to be confused, the two of them, the, the character overlay is for the, the south side of town, essentially. Um, and then the zoning in progress is uh, we, we uh, stopped construction as we put the overlay in place. And that was to address specifically 
what the, the uh, young lady was talking about in terms of um, ensuring that new construction in the area adhered to whatever regulations were to be put in place. Um, I have, in my experience uh, as a city planner, gone through two of zoning and progress, and they're both very successful as far as ensuring that the type of development that went in uh, to the subject area was appropriate and what the city commission had wanted to see. So the city commission was approached by a group of residents uh, just over a year ago, right, regarding uh, you know some of the exact same things that 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 uh, you were talking about, um, the, the massing on lots, the large McMansions, if you will, which are built across <coughs> lot lines. Um, the the they don't not necessarily compatible some of the construction in the area, and the city commission uh, had heard a lot uh, from your constituents as well to that end repeatedly um, over a period of time. And as a result, the City Commission uh, directed staff to hire a consultant to help us with some sort of, didn't know what it was, what, what form it would take, but some way to protect, protect the, the historic aesthetic, if you will, of the neighborhood, the quaintness of the neighborhood, the, the, um, the vibe that everybody thinks is so special in that area. And I know that vibe because, as all of you know, I live in the overlay as well, and I walk my dog all around um, that area. Uh, and so this, the city commission, uh, the staff hired Kimley Horn to, to develop some regulations which would respect the underlying entitlements on the property, the setbacks, the height, uh, the front and side uh, yard setbacks, and, and the aesthetic as well. Um, the, the overlay then is not a rezoning, and it is uh, um, in any way, shape, or form. It is a way to address and to ensure that future development is compatible with the rest of the neighborhood and what's there already as far as scale, mass, and, and, and the aesthetics. The uh, city commission then saw the overlay, I think it was uh, last November, and wanted us to go back to, uh, to the members of the community to make sure that they understood exactly what the overlay was uh, and what it would do and what it would not do as well. And so we did that, and that was a direct mail notification that we did uh, in, the, in the southern part of town in the, within the overlay. Um, and that resulted in the third meeting, which was the one at the Hale Center. And the one at the Hale Center, I think that there were a lot of new folks there. The first two meetings that we had were very successful. There was a lot of really good uh, citizen input into the overlay, uh, and we took a lot of those suggestions and incorporated them in, in, in the overlay. The third meeting, however, a lot of folks hadn't been in the first two meetings. And we should have gone back, I feel, at that meeting and explained exactly what the issue is. In the, in, the, uh, in the character overlay. And the issue is that there's multifamily zone property in that area, and it's a, it's a layover from a long time ago when the city was originally planned and zoned. So you have single family lots in that neighborhood, and you know a lot of uh, your homes are built on those single family lots, but you also have large areas that are multifamily. Someone could technically come, assemble all that property, and build a multifamily structure in the middle of the neighborhoods. And so really that's what the overlay is looking to address, is that particular issue. Um, still respecting property rights, still allowing for development on the site, um, on that lot. Um, uh, you know, the height in the MF-15, and there is MF-15 within the overlay area is 50 feet. And so that's really where the daylight plane came into effect, which is where, where you essentially uh, scope back or move the mass back with respect to height so you don't have the big block buildings. <laughs> Um, and, and that will become will come before the city commission, the two meetings in April, right, on a Thursday evening. It'll be duly notified uh, in the newspaper and those types of things. So, so I think that there's been a lot that has spun off of that, that third meeting at the Hale Center. We did send a, a, an email out to try to correct some of the information that had been, um, you know, and it was people who just didn't understand, right? And we could have explained it better. There's no doubt in my mind. And I would still like that opportunity to explain it much better to the community, exactly what the overlay is. Because once it's in place, it would probably be one of the best things that this city commission could do. Because it respects the underlying property rights on the lot. The front yard setback is still there. The side yard setback is there. The height, you can still get to the height um, within that zoning district uh, if you scope it back properly. You can still get accessory dwelling units on the property and all those sorts of things, but it is the overlay is an additional um, uh, capacity or, or uh, requirement, if you will, that you adhere to the feel of that neighborhood via the architectural styles. 
um, that you that you respect the the historic nature of the neighborhood through compatibility regulations, which are inherent in our comprehensive plan, and all those sorts of things. So, you know, the two the two folks who provided uh, input, I thank you very much. Uh, the overlay is is really um, a work effort to address those concerns very specifically. And I think that we still have a lot of work to do on the overlay. It's coming to the to the local planning agency on March 22nd. Uh, we are going to, in that presentation, staff is going to go all the way back to the beginning to explain exactly what the overlay is, exactly why it's important to that area, exactly what it can do, and exactly what it can't do. It's not a rezoning. It's, it, it's not, this is not, not an involuntary rezoning. It is uh, an overlayment of uh, additional requirements to support the vitality of that neighborhood very specifically. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Okay. Um, now it's time for our presentation. Um, I, I see both of our peeps are here today, Whit Blanton and um, Mayor Cookie Kennedy from Indian Rocks Beach. If you guys will come right over here to that staff table. Um, and this uh, presentation will take a little while, guys. Uh, there, I gave a long list of requests for updates. Since I have not been able to do my commission updates, What's going to do it for me? Welcome, guys. I'm so excited to be here. I said, she stole my word, peeps. I already had planned to say that. John, hi. And, and you know, uh, Cookie, yeah. was, Cookie was here Monday night for the Ukraine candlelight. Yeah, vision. that was so nice. You know, I love this town. I really do. And some of the things that you've done, um, you know, I, my background's a little bit in mixed juice. That's my home is mixed juice. And was one of the first ones built in Indian Rock Beach. But when I drive around and I'm walking around and looking at all the planning that you guys have done, it is awesome. And so the reason we're here today is when I got to be chair this year, one of the things that Witt said, well, what, do, what, are, your, what are your dreams for Ford Pinellas? And I said that I, in looking forward, I want to make sure that the city's and the residents that live in the cities know what we're about, the grants that we sometimes can offer, and talk about community living, mixed use, um, sidewalks, bicycle lanes, crosswalks, all the things that we have to offer at Ford Pinellas, and a real positive agenda this year, um, and more of a group effort with all of the 13 elected officials that serve on the, on the agency. And I know John's been on there before, and you loved the time that you were on there with us, correct? Yeah. And so I just said to Witt, I think we should, we had a road show once before when Witt first started, and I thought we should start again. And one of the ways to talk about and get the word out about Ford Pinellas, talk about our website, talk about the great staff we have, all the planning options we have would be to go back to the cities and try to get you know, uh, almost like uh, being a, um, I want to say merchandiser, but that's not the right Show word. Yeah, so that everybody can know what we're doing and what we're about. So, and then, of course, I bring the, the, the best piece of Ford Pinellas, Whit Blanton, with me because he's so bright and, and all of the things that he's brought to Ford Pinellas since he came here. And, and with that, I'm just going to let him go on and kind of talk about where we're at and where we're hoping to head. And one of the other things, Julie, I just want to tell you about Julie. Okay, Julie, if it wasn't for Julie, we probably wouldn't have a waterborne transportation because Julie always has my back. And I've been asking for it. But once I had Julie right on my back, then we got, a, we got the waterborne transportation because she, uh, our committee is really working incredibly to have uh, Dunedin and then Clearwater and then move into some other areas in a second phase. So, and, and Julie participates and gives so much and is such an advocate for Dunedin that you sh everyone in this community should know how much she loves this community and how much I appreciate her too. So I just wanted to add that as a little piece. And with that, I'm gonna go on and let Whit Blanton really tell you the, the ins and outs of what's going on at Ford Pinellas. Well, thank you uh, for that, and thanks for the time. It's good to be back here again. Uh, I do want to update you on a number of things that we're working on, and uh, particularly uh, some of the projects that are here in the city of Dunedin or Dunedin adjacent. 
So just a reminder for those who may be watching and are unfamiliar with our agency, we are the countywide transportation planning agency, all modes of transportation, uh, and also we guide land use decisions uh, at a countywide level. We don't get into the business of local government um, overlays and setbacks and things like that, but we do uh, enable uh, development in the right locations uh, with the right protections uh, where we have supportive infrastructure in place to, to guide that development. And Pinellas County is a redeveloping county. We don't have open space for development, um, so we're redeveloping when we see new development, or in some cases it's infill. And we want to make sure that that's done in the right locations, in the right context, in the right character. So we've enabled cities to do things, but it's ultimately up to the cities to do the things that they want to do um, with the input from their citizens. Uh, our vision, this slide, is a reflection of uh, what we call Advantage Pinellas, which is our long-range uh, planning uh, document that covers both land use and transportation. And at the center of this triangle you see up here is community, environment, and economic opportunity. Uh, that is first. We don't do transportation for transportation's sake. Uh, it is to support uh, these other things. And we look at a three-legged stool of improving traffic flow and congestion, creating safe streets and trail networks, and enhancing public transportation options for people. Uh, and uh, again, we're planning for about 100,000 new residents uh, in Pinellas County, and we can't put gates around the county, so we have to guide that growth appropriately and set it up for where density makes sense, where it doesn't make sense. And we also have a thing called the coastal high hazard area, and we want to ensure that higher density um, development does not happen in the coastal high hazard area um, unless it's properly mitigated. And it's hard to mitigate um, in, in the vulnerable county that we are. Uh, we have uh, several strategic initiatives in place. Uh, we continue to work on a vision for US-19, and I have some uh, updates on that from a conversation I had with DOT. Enhancing beach community access, which includes everything from Honeymoon Island all the way down to um, St. Pete Beach and, and um, Pass a Grill. Uh, innovations in target employment and jobs access is really important, particularly related to the Coca-Cola property <coughs> that you have here in the city of Dunedin. Um, so I'll start with that one first. We have uh, initiated work on what's called a target employment industrial land study that is looking at an inventory of all of the designated uh, employment and industrial land categories in Pinellas County. And we've had a provision since 2008 to protect those lands virtually at all costs. I mean, there is uh, the ability to change an industrial or employment-based land use, but it's a really high bar and it doesn't happen often. Uh, and so um, that's probably an antiquated approach and we need to re recognize that not all industrial lands are equal and we've been treating them essentially as equal. Um, and so we're going through this study that will be completed this year that will um, look at um, surveys and um, assessments of what target employers need. These are our higher wage uh, employers in the healthcare and manufacturing arenas. Um, and we're third in the state in manufacturing jobs. Not a lot of people know that. And we kind of toggle between second and third with Orange County uh, after Miami-Dade, but that's an important part of our economic diversity. But they're not all equal. Some have better interstate access, some are near rail lines, uh, others are surrounded by residential neighborhoods, and maybe something other than industrial manufacturing could be appropriate there. But we need this study to help us uh, and guide that so that we understand that what we're doing when we make policy changes and then we're not having unintended consequences of that. We have a stakeholder group that we're forming and an advisory committee that's being formed. So uh, you'll be on the advisory committee, uh, at least your staff will be. If you have uh, uh, partners and employers in Dunedin that you would like to be recommended for the advisory group, we're all ears uh, because that's happening right now. Uh, the next thing that's part of this is what we call our investment corridor transition plan. And this is guiding growth to the right areas. And what we did in 2019 when we adopted our long range plan is we identified a number of commercial corridors in Pinellas County that um, are a legacy of the 1960s, 70s, and 80s development pattern. And uh, we need to transition those corridors into a more urban pattern. Uh, and uh, an example of that would be Alt-19 south of Clearwater to St. Petersburg, where um, retail, the nature of retail development has changed dramatically in the last 20 years, and it continues to evolve. 
and we also have an affordable housing crisis in Pinellas County and throughout Tampa Bay, and so we're looking at these corridors as ways to serve both those needs, guiding redevelopment and connecting people uh, with jobs and places that are affordable to live. And these corridors are prime redevelopment opportunities. Um, so again, it won't be willy-nilly, it'll be guided, planned growth, but we have kicked off the investment corridor transition plan with the board's action yesterday to approve a scope of work for the Alt-19 corridor, and we've got a consultant selected and we'll be working on that over the course of about the next 16 months. Uh, and it will look at uh, this corridor to connect to the Sunrunner a bus rapid transit project that's under construction in St. Petersburg, and then link that to the northern part of the county. So beginning to develop a countywide transit strategy, which we've really lacked in this county. We've kind of been one off pursuing individual projects and tweaks of this route and this route there, uh, but we need, we need an overall vision for that. So this is part of that. Uh, Mayor Kennedy uh, referenced our Waterborne Transportation Committee, and yesterday the board took action to uh, adopt a series of recommendations and a phasing strategy for that. The first part of that is to restart, I don't think I have more detail on this, I don't, uh, is to restart the service that was operating on the regular uh, basis in 2019, then the pandemic happened. And so that's been a subscription-based service. Uh, what this begins to do is get it back to that first level that we had in 2019 between Dunedin, Clearwater, and Clearwater Beach and then expand from there. Uh, it would be under the uh, administration of Pinellas Suncoast Transit Authority, which would give it more structure, more, more guidance, and the passenger, the ridership, will then come back to us in the form of formula funding for PSTA. And so I think that's also an important consideration because before that wasn't happening, we weren't even really counting ridership. Uh, we'll also commit to our agency being the monitor and evaluator of the service, and we won't proceed in any subsequent phases until we're confident that this is working well uh, and it's achieving its mission, and it's doing so at a limited uh, public subsidy. And I say those words because we know public transportation uh, doesn't run, turn a profit, and if you want fares to be reasonable for people to use on a regular basis, you're going to have to have some operating assistance. Um, so uh, we are uh, working in partnership with PSTA uh, and the cities of Dunedin, Clearwater, and Pinellas County to get that service started. And that's a negotiation that's ongoing, but we hope to have that done uh, by, the end, by the beginning of FY23. Uh, and I know you've set aside some funding in your budget, so thank you for, for stepping forward and showing leadership in that. We're working on the county now. Um, and the Cross Bay Ferry is all of that. Uh, the county had a really hard discussion about the Cross Bay Ferry, and they wanted to see it better integrated into the overall <coughs> countywide uh, policy, and so we've developed that policy for the county's consideration. Uh, I want to touch on the major transportation projects that are under construction or about to go under construction. Uh, you've seen, if you've been down by the airport area, the Gateway Expressway, it's a toll facility to connect US-19 to I-275 and the Brian Derry uh, Road corridor to I-275. Uh, that's uh, under construction and it's expected to be complete about a year from now, spring of 2023. Uh, and that will shave off about 11 to 12 minutes of travel time getting from say 49th Street to 275. Uh, and that's a substantial benefit. Uh, it will also tie into the Howard Franklin Bridge that's under construction uh, right now. And Howard Franklin will take about three years to complete. Uh, and when that happens, there'll be uh, four additional travel lanes, two in each direction, they'll be told. Uh, those lanes will be variable priced uh, according to congestion. Um, so you will always, um, in theory, have an, have an option to pay a toll to get on those congestion-free lanes. Traffic is uh, expected to be operating at a minimum of 45 miles an hour, and that's why the tolls will rise if necessary as congestion increases to keep that 45 mile an hour flowing. Uh, Miami has that, Orlando now has that, and Tampa Bay will soon have that in place. And that's a statewide policy. It wasn't our decision to do that, but uh, it's something that FDOT is doing. Along with that, starting in FY23, will be construction of the West Shore Interchange in Tampa. Uh, that is a $1.3 billion project uh, that the uh, legislature and the governor funded uh, largely with federal money. Uh, that project will be under construction for six years. Um, so I'm sorry, uh, it's going to be painful, uh, but we are working with FDOT to develop a maintenance of traffic plan. 
uh, and, um, and guide people accordingly. A lot of the work will be done at night, but not all of it will be, and there will be some lane closures. So um, we'll just have to uh, brace for that construction. But it is an important economic um, uh, project that will really leverage um, access to the airport, access to Pinellas County from Hillsboro, uh, and I think that's important. Um, closer to home, US-19 from Maine uh, 580 to Curlew uh, is starting construction this year. Uh, the bids will be let sometime in the next month or so, and that will be a con three-year construction project. It will include an interchange at Curlew Road. The signal at Republic Drive will go away. That will be a flyover. Uh, there will be um, uh, underpasses and overpasses about every half mile, and there will be U-turn turnarounds at Boy Scout Road, um, so that it mirrors what you see on US-19 to the south. Uh, we have been disappointed that we don't have the segment funded from Curlew North through Tampa Road, but that's next up, and we're actively working with FDOT to get that in the work program uh, as soon as possible. Uh, and then uh, the news that I heard today from FDOT is that they are, um, they are working on the frontage roads reconstruction uh, starting from Drew Street to Sunset Point Road, and that is to make the frontage roads safer. We've had a number of fatalities and injuries uh, on those frontage roads, and they were built, um, I think, in a substandard design uh, back in the 1990s and early 2000s, and they are going to do away with those really skinny bike lanes on the frontage roads and build wide, wider sidewalks, and they have a resurfacing project that will help us with some of that. Uh, we'll also look at um, slowing down the traffic speeds on the frontage roads so that they're not 45 to 50 miles an hour. Those merge and weaving areas can be really unsafe. Uh, so the idea is to get traffic closer to about a uniform 35 miles an hour on the frontage roads. And then uh, for the interchanges going north to the Pasco County line, we've had it in our plan for years uh, to build interchanges all the way to the Pasco County line, but Pasco County does not have those interchanges in their plan. They took them out. And so um, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense just to push all that traffic to the county line. Uh, and we think that we can do uh, at-grade uh, intersection improvements without the flyovers and overpasses north of Tampa Road. So really beginning at Klosterman, Alderman, and Tarpon Avenue, uh, where they would be intersection improvements. And the cost of those is about half of what you would do for an interchange. And FDOT's preliminary planning tells us that they would work from a safety and mobility. You get the same safety and mobility benefits at half the cost. Uh, and that's because you've got a big lake on one side of them, and so you can time the traffic signals better at those locations. So they haven't done all the engineering feasibility, but they've committed to finishing that up and having a work session with our board sometime later this year or in early 23 to resolve that. And it's been kind of a slow process, but I, I'm all for saving money if we can still get the same benefit for doing that. The north gap of the Pinellas Trail you see under construction on the east side of US-19. Uh, that will be finished this year through the countryside neighborhood. That will be a key part of completing the 75-mile Pinellas Trail loop around the county. Uh, we have 47 miles constructed today, a little more than that, uh, but about 47 miles on the, on, from Tarpon to St. Petersburg. Uh, this um, gap, uh, I forget the length of it, but it begins to complete that 75-mile loop, and then all we'll have left is the Southern Gap, which is funded for construction in the next three years, but they're still working out some alignment issues in the Largo-Whitney Road area. Um, just like in the countryside area, homeowners have had some concerns about a trail coming behind their homes. We have not seen any evidence of that bringing any sort of negative effects. In fact, what it's done is it's raised property values by having that trail amenity nearby. And finally, the Sun Runner is our major transit project in St. Petersburg. Doesn't really affect the city of Dunedin, except for it was the first time the Tampa Bay region received federal funding for transit in this <coughs> program area. And um, that's a landmark event after 50 years of trying for that funding. And uh, we hope to build on that success. Uh, we also have an interactive transportation improvement program that you can look at on our website to see all the projects around uh, Pinellas County that are uh, planned for construction or design or any other phase in the next five years. Every year in May, we adopt our annual list of priorities. So uh, actually, it'll be June this year. We just have to do it by July 1st. And uh, we are uh, currently um, working on refining that list of priorities. It's what 
the state DOT uses to develop its five-year list of work program projects. And um, the nice thing about being a large urban area like Pinellas County is they can't put things in the work program that we don't have on our priority list. Um, and so, except for a couple of exceptions, uh, for the most part, they have to follow our direction, and that's really great. Um, if we were a smaller urbanized area like Gainesville, they don't have to listen to them. Uh, so uh, we have a call for projects every year to solicit ideas from every local government. And so I would encourage the city of Dunedin to solicit projects, not only for that major project priority list, but for our multimodal, uh, but for our complete streets and our transportation alternatives grant programs. Um, and again, this is something that um, we'll see come to fruition by September of every year when they announce the new fifth year of the work program. Uh, we are working on safety studies throughout um, Pinellas County. Um, Gulf Boulevard is about to get started because it's one of our high injury network roadways. Uh, but we are also working on safety projects in the city of Dunedin as well. And I'll talk about those in just a moment. Uh, but this is one that the city of St. Pete Beach and Treasure Island came to us and they're funding this study and we're the technical lead on this effort. Uh, in Dunedin, uh, one of those safety projects is the State Road 580 Skinner Boulevard and Pinellas Trail Crossing. Um, you've gotten, I'm sure, briefings on this, and your staff has done a great job uh, working with FDOT in Pinellas County. Uh, we are, uh, within the next month, having a full traffic signal installed at this crossing. Uh, that crossing was determined by the city and the county and state to be the best alternative in a short-term time frame to reduce the, the risk of injury and fatality at that location. It's a very popular crossing, as you all know. And this will introduce a red, green, yellow phased full traffic signal at that crossing that will be fully activated by pushing the button, but it won't be an immediate activation. So what will happen is if a cyclist or a pedestrian comes to that intersection, they'll press the button, and then the cycle uh, will determine when it will turn green. Uh, and it'll be timed with the Alt-19 uh, Broadway uh, intersection with, uh, with, with Skinner. Uh, so you'll have, when you have the green north and south, you'll have the green on the trail. Uh, you won't have it conflicting. And uh, there will be high visibility law enforcement out there. DOT has confirmed for a minimum of 30 days after it's installed and operational, but I suspect we can extend that as, as need be. And the um, high visibility enforcement will be to ensure that everybody is complying and that behavior is modified, uh, whether that be through warnings or ultimately through fines. Um, I think it's something that is certainly a hot topic in this community and, and we're eager to do everything in our power to make it fit better. I think there's some other things that the county staff has suggested that could also be done, uh, such as modifying the trail itself so instead of being just a straight shot to the intersection, the trail might have some horizontal curves in it that would force people to slow down as they approach that crossing. Uh, that's, that's something I don't object to and I think would be a good solution. Uh, the county doesn't have the ability to do that right away, but they might look into that as a next step. Um, so I'd be happy to answer any questions uh, as I get through this presentation on that. Uh, we know that the Complete Streets project is coming for Skinner, and uh, that design is underway. Uh, we have advanced construction to the year, uh, well, fiscal year 24, which could start as late as fall of 23. Uh, we are excited uh, about this project because it's an innovative approach to a state highway. And unlike a lot of other places around the state where these kinds of uh, changes are made, the state's going to retain ownership of this roadway. It's not turning it over to the county or to the city of Dunedin to maintain forever, uh, which is good news. Uh, and uh, this design will accommodate all users and it will bring the, the speeds on that roadway down and I think you'll see safety improvements happen. Uh, for Honeymoon Island and the Dunedin Causeway, I wanted to update you. Um, thanks, Mayor and uh, City Manager Bramley for the conference call that we had last week. Uh, we got an update uh, from the Department of Environmental Protection and and others on this project. Uh, I wanna say that we're all uh, disappointed that the construction is happening through peak season. That was nobody's intent. I don't even think it was the Department of Environmental Protection's intent, uh, but they got the funding uh, beginning this fiscal year, which didn't happen until October 1st. And then they had some administrative hurdles they had to resolve first before they could get construction underway. So I think they're working as quickly as possible. 
Unfortunately, construction won't be complete until July, we learned. Um, so it will add, it will expand the toll plazas so that you have multiple entrances coming into the park. Uh, we had hoped that we would have a dedicated entrance for season pass holders, uh, but that is not currently in the works. Uh, but that is something that they're looking into, and hopefully we can continue to push for that. And once it's opened, uh, they will then create that opportunity for season pass holders to have um, uh, an expedited avenue for, for getting through. I do think that they are doing something for expedited activity for bicyclists who want to get through, and, and they'll have a, a, a quicker option uh, onto Honeymoon Island. Anyway, it will uh, ease entrance uh, into the park. One of the challenges, though, is that when you make it easier to get into the park, that parking lot will fill up faster, and they may have to close the, the park because there are no parking spaces. And so now we're working on getting some variable message signs uh, that the county is providing installed um, on the causeway and also on Alt-19 and on Curlew to the east of, of Alt-19 that will let folks know when the park is closed and the parking lot is full. Park staff will be able to operate that remotely. So as soon as they know the parking lot is full, they'll change the signage to say park closed until 2 p.m. or 1 p.m. or whatever the time may be, and then they can change that. Um, so that, that's, I think, helpful. In uh, FY24, we will have cameras and fiber optic cable installed and permanent uh, variable message signs. So this is kind of a temporary fix, and thanks to Pinellas County for getting those signs uh, ready. They will also be holding a training session for city, park, and county staff to uh, adjust those signs as need be. Um, the other thing that's happening is for um, improvements to uh, the intersection at Alt-19 and Causeway Boulevard itself. And we've completed a, a design for that. Uh, we're in the comment phase on that design. What will happen is Alt-19, as you approach Curlew Road, will widen to four through travel lanes, two in each direction. Um, and that will uh, then taper back uh, to the two-lane configuration well to the north and south of the intersection. And then there'll be some other safety improvements for walkers and bicycling in that area. There's $4 million set aside for this uh, improvement that will cover the cost of the construction. Um, you know, some people have called for an overpass, and, and I've heard those, those calls for the trail. Uh, my concern about that is we have almost as many trail users and pedestrians and bicyclists going east and west as we do north and south in that location. And that overpass would be anywhere from eight to nine to $10 million. So it's a pretty extensive, expensive project. Uh, if this doesn't materially improve things, you know, there are other things like an overpass that longer term we could certainly consider. Um, we also have um, a roundabout that we're designing at the end of the Causeway Boulevard to facilitate better turnarounds as the park entrance may be closed when the parking lot is full. Uh, the state of Florida has done a design in concept for that. Um, the park has indicated they prefer the full roundabout. The construction of that is about $350,000, not including design. Um, we don't yet know where the money will come to pay for that, um, but we're working with state, county, uh, and local government staff to figure that out, and hopefully we'll have a solution to that uh, in the next six months or a year uh, on how we fund that. I can't use federal funds for that, so I won't be able to help pay for that roundabout because that's inside the park and my federal funds and my state funds are limited uh, to either being on the state highway system, which is not, or not within a, a state park, and, that, and it is in the state park. Uh, but I will do my best to advocate for funding for that turnaround, because I think it's important, part of the whole mix of improvements. And I think I've covered all that. Um, again, well, we can... a lot going on in the <laughs> I know. <laughs> Honestly, well, good. thanks to the mayor. Yeah. Uh, she, she's a real advocate here. Uh, finally, um, I don't, I'm not sure it's final, but I'm getting close. I want to thank you again for adopting the Safe Streets Pinellas resolution. Uh, we continue to have an inordinate number of fatalities and injuries on our road network. 165 people in 2021. That's not just walkers and, and bicycle, bicyclists. That's everybody. Uh, but that's uh, a lot. And if you count people who are seriously injured, it's more than two a day on our roads. Uh, so we've adopted safety targets to bring that down by 20% in the next two years. Um, and, and I do think we have uh, a good strategy in place to do that. Our entire work program 
Everything we fund is judged on its ability to reduce fatalities and injuries. Um, and so you might see that we're not building a lot of high capacity projects because we have right of way limits. You'll encroach into neighborhoods and encroach into businesses, but we can do a lot of things for safety. And that's got to be our focus. And you're also one of six communities with Indian Rocks Beach and Dunedin, two of the six who are a part of the Safe Streets program so far. So I already told everybody before I leave, uh, the, the Ford Pinellas, they all better be a part of the Safe mm -hmm. Streets program. <laughs> we all need to be a part of that. Absolutely, and, and St. Pete will adopt in April, and then I think we've got a couple of other cities that are happening this spring, I'm working on Clearwater. Um, legislative updates, um, I won't go into too much detail of this. The session is wrapping up. We've been actively engaged. Um, we've focused on the bills that we're directly affected by, so a lot of the, the, the most media attention legislation it, we're not really engaged in. It's been actually a pretty smooth year for us, uh, but there has been one bill, um, this Senate Bill 962, House Bill 981, which would allow for mixed-use residential development in industrial and employment areas, notwithstanding any local government ordinances to the contrary. And again, I said earlier, we've been trying to protect and preserve our employment lands. And once they become res residential, they're never going back because you can get a whole lot more money for residential than you can for industrial land. It's about $7 a square foot for industrial land compared to, you know, the sky's the limit for a residential. So this bill is poised to pass and we see another preemption from Tallahassee that really does threaten our industrial base. It doesn't mean that local governments can't hold the line, but our agency can no longer hold the line on industrial land if it's mixed use. And all you have to do is have 10% affordable housing in there. Uh, the bipartisan infrastructure law passed earlier this year, and we do expect uh, a lot of money flowing to Pinellas County. We will have substantially more revenues for safety projects, for transportation alternatives, uh, and for uh, surface transportation block grant funds, which can go to virtually anything. Uh, but uh, the money has been slow to come because Congress is sort of wrapped around the axle of uh, a continuing resolution and the debt ceiling. So there's some things in Washington that are holding this up, but I'm expecting that by July of this year, we'll start to see some of these dollars flow to Pinellas County. And our job is to bring most of those as much of those dollars to our needs as we can. And it will take partnerships. So we'll need the cities, we'll need the county to be asking for the same things because so much of this money is locked up into competitive programs that will be competing nationally for those funds. And we better have a really good project and a really good ask. Uh, and I think we do, um, but we can't compete against ourselves by trying to submit five or six projects for the same funding source. And that's where priorities become really important. I'm really proud that yesterday the board adopted our equity uh, assessment recommendations to make sure that we are <coughs> Uh, investing in transportation needs and thinking about land use and development for everybody in our county uh, and not just those with the means. Um, and what you see uh, here on the map in yellow are our um, uh, equity emphasis areas and most of our high injury road network cuts right through these areas. So there is a disproportionate impact on communities of color and communities that are uh, lower income neighborhoods. And um, it's our ethical responsibility as planners to be responsible for uh, these communities. And I'm proud of that. Uh, and I'm proud of the board's action yesterday to unanimously adopted this. So that's my update. Uh, Mayor, I think I covered all those topics, but if I missed anything, the you, speed you limits. Speed limits on Edgewater. Yeah. Um, uh, so uh, all FD the way to <clears throat> Sunset Point. FDOT has agreed to conduct a speed study on Edgewater and Bayshore to look at lowering the speeds out there. Um, the speed study does not by itself mean that we'll lower the speeds, but the speed study provides the data and analysis that we can use to either lower the speed limits or uh, adapt the roadway in other ways that will effectively lower the speed limit. Uh, and you've talked about having some center island medians uh, as, as ways to top, stop people from speeding uh, and passing in the center lane. So those are some things that they will look at as part of that. Um, but we have a good partnership with FDOT, and I think they'll be honest brokers at looking at that. Okay, and then the other piece of it was, um, 
The 580 corridor study. The 580 corridor study, thank you. Um, so FDOT is looking at 580 from Alt-19 all the way to Oldsmar. Uh, it is a corridor planning effort. Uh, it's the very first stage that you go before you get into design and right-of-way and then engineering and construction. Uh, that study is progressing reasonably well. Um, they have uh, delivered to us a purpose and need report and um, an existing conditions report. And uh, your staff is, is engaged in reviewing that and providing comments. Uh, we are, the next phase that we're working on now is development of alternatives. So uh, I expect to have a report showing the different alternatives this fall. Um, and so we've provided some comments on those previous documents and we're waiting to see when that um, alternatives will be released. When, when do we as a uh, board get a chance to see what they're doing? I think we'll have a workshop once we have received that <coughs> development of alternatives and provided some comments. And then we will ask for public workshops this fall. That because, would be my expectation. Because I know there are two big things with 580. One, one is the suicide lane and the inability, you know, and how dangerous it can be and the inability to have medians and we need them in certain areas. Um, and the other piece is I hear a lot from Dunedin residents, even though it's not in Dunedin, and that is the lack of a right turn lane on um, on 580 on to 19. 19. That, that backs up all of that development that's there that we had nothing to do with, backs that traffic up all the way to Belcher sometimes. And especially during rush hour, it's, it's horrific. And if, you, if we had a turn lane there, mm -hmm. it should have never been designed without one. Nope. Everywhere else has one, except us. Right. So it's a problem. It is, and they're aware of it. We've made them aware of it. I, th I think they're definitely addressing that. Here's the mentality that DOT had when they built all these overpasses is uh, they went with the least impact to right of way. So they purposefully built the overpasses all the way down to Pinellas Park with minimal acquisition of right of way. And I think that was a mistake because you're building something for 50 years. Sometimes you need to do it right. And we've seen safety problems and we've seen mobility problems as a result of that as we've continued to grow. So that short-sighted thinking is, is distressing, but a lot of that got done during the recession, and so I understand why they were being cost-conscious, but uh, I think if you're taking on a transportation project, you can do it right, and sometimes that does require biting the bullet and buying right away. Sure. Okay, I'll start with questions. Vice Mayor, any questions? Um, I just one. Um, of course, I'll, I am very interested in reducing the speed uh, all the way, Alt-19, and you did talk about South Alt-19, but you really didn't talk about Sunset Point on up, which we have had several uh, sessions with FDOT on how we would plan, what we think, how, you know, future visit, visions. So what's going on with that? Was that a... That was on my list, too. Yeah. It, it was an especially exercise like the in <coughs> utility? Especially, I mean. especially like the difference in the lane sizes as well as the... Um, at the marina and Main Street intersection. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the Main Street intersection is a, was a biggie. Um, mm -hmm. That was talked about, but I don't know. It just sort of it's disappeared nowhere. up in the ether. So, so. Their speed, the speed study will go from Sunset Point all the way north to Curlew, as far as I understand. And that's what we'll push for, is to do the speed study for the whole thing. And you might have to break it down and look at it a little bit differently, and the recommendations may not be uniform. Um, I, it's a little frustrating to uh, Mayor Kennedy and I that Gulf Boulevard has a similar situation. I was and just thinking we could bring them up together. Yeah, <laughs> and we go from 35 miles an hour to 30 miles an hour to 40 miles an hour, and it used to be 40 uh, and 45 some sections. So they've gotten it down to 30 and 35, but that, that's a hodgepodge of treatments on Gulf Boulevard, and that confuses people. So we'd like it to be more consistent through the city of Dunedin. Uh, so that speed study is the first step in, in doing that. Uh, they did the planning study in 2018, um, and that's still guiding us uh, for the entire Alt-19 corridor from Bel Air north to the Pasco County line. We um, have the Curlew Alt-19 intersection improvements as sort of the first real project coming out of that. Uh, we are uh, working with FDOT to put on our priority list the next project, and we think the next project could very well be the marina intersection uh, on Alt-19. 
Yeah, you did. Um, and, and maybe pair that with, because it, it really goes tandem, because you've got that dog leg uh, treatment there, so you, you deal with the marina access, and then you've got the main street where it turns, uh, and then probably you need to look at the Skinner intersection as well, because it all kind of works together. Uh, the other area that we're focused on is in Tarpon, and then there's another one uh, in Clearwater at Myrtle and Gulf to Bay. So. Maybe we'll put like a list. We're gonna we're gonna be talking to the secretary. I'm kind of too. He's not gonna like I'm saying this, but um, and I'm thinking that we could add those two pieces because they have to do with speed limits and making them more uniform. Um, maybe we can talk to him about those at that time when we see him. And they're both on iconic road. <coughs> Absolutely. Yeah. That's what I was thinking when he was talking, when you brought it up, Deb. And they're all on our high injury network, which yes. is important. Big time. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Commissioner? Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, what First, you know I have to say one thing. That's a hot shirt. Gotta <laughs> love it. <laughs> It's, loves it's, uh, it's annual. It's uh, annual Piper Day or something. Right? <laughs> International Piper Day. It's International Bagpipe Day. There you yeah, go. So thank you. International Drake Scotch. Very much. Well, that's every day. That's every day. It just depends on what time of day, whether what kind of scotch you drink. Um, when, you know, I can't beat the drum on multimodal any any louder or or pro bikes or anything to help reduce traffic. I don't think we have parking problems. I think we have transportation problems. And the more we can use other types of transportation, even for those that like their cars, the more people we can get in public transit and bicycles, the easier traffic is for them in their own car. So it's not that I'm anti-car for, for anybody. Um, you had made mention, um, in general, short-sightedness. And you talked about it was kind of built wrong Mm -hmm. um, the frontage roads and going back. And I know any time that there's construction on a road or, or intersection, once that's done, circling back to fix it if there's a problem takes years, if not decades, to, mm -hmm. to come back. And so what protects cities and residents from that short-sightedness? How can we make sure that best modern day practices are implemented with every new project? Um, that's a great, great it's a great question. Um, you have somebody like Wit who's watching how they're planning it? Yeah, I mean, our, our, agency, our agency is an advocate for uh, Pinellas County and its communities and for multimodal transportation. When I took this job seven years ago today, I was hired, by the way. And um, I was, yeah, I was <laughs> you were part of that. Team. So today's my anniversary. And I'm still happy about that job. <laughs> um, yeah, and Commissioner Torngo was on there as well. Um, but, you know, um, what I was going to say about that is we really feel like for 25 years or more, Pinellas County has been saying we're redeveloping and we need multimodal. And the rubber really hadn't met the road for a long, long time. And, you know, it's time to step up to the plate and really embrace that. Uh, because Pinellas County, we have to plan differently. We're a very dense urban county. It's not all, it's not all urban, it's a lot of it's suburban, uh, but the whole county is, we can't, we can't manage our way out of congestion by building more lanes. So, um, you know, sometimes what happens in the engineering and design process is that you, you, you do, um, you know, you look at engineering valuation and what is it costing? And cost control becomes a big factor. And sometimes you cut costs because you have to get the price down, but you, you then start eliminating some of the things that are really important for comfort and convenience uh, of all users. And I've seen that happen. It's not just the turn lane on, on 580 at US 19. It's not building the bike path wide enough because you don't want to spend the money on a 15-foot path, so you build a 12-foot path, or you build a 10-foot or an 8-foot path. And that just leads to conflicts. Um, so I think some of those things have happened. Um, we are going to be a strong advocate. We have a bicycle pedestrian advisory committee that also Wonderful weighs in. advisory committee. Yeah, and they're very active. Uh, they, they really pay attention to the trail <clears throat> issues, but they also pay attention to surface street issues. Uh, we have a citizens advisory committee that helps us. And we're looking for members, by the way, on both those committees. And we have open applications now. Um, and you know, we'll, we'll 
pay you for your time, just like a lot of us volunteers get paid. Uh, it's, but it, but it's, 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 it's really worthwhile, uh, and, and you can really have a say in those decisions. So we bird dog every project that comes through. We uh, review the engineering designs. We comment on them. Pinellas County, your city staff, if it's in the city of Dunedin, get to comment on those. Uh, and I would encourage you to come to Ford Pinellas and, and raise any issues to our board, and we'll bring them up, and we'll put DOT on the spot or the county on the spot, and we'll ask those questions. Okay. You know, Jeff, to the other thing, almost as an elected official looking in, we have an awesome relationship with the FDOT, the new secretary. Those were things that we didn't have before. There is this respect for open ideas. They're very uh, open to different ide ideas um, from, from Ford Pinellas. And, and I think that has a, an important impact with these, these kinds of issues and, and um, any of our uh, projects that are being done. I think that's an important piece too. It's not like it was before. Um, and and they, they love wit. They're ready to sit down at the table. No, they do like, they really do, honest. Love love no, no, they really do. I think they have a great respect <clears throat> for him and his ideas. And, and I think that helps because I, I think if something came up and wit said to him, said to them, you know, I don't think that that would be the best thing. I really think that they take his ideas seriously. And, and, and that's, DOTs are not like that around the country. We have a very unique situation here, and, and we're very fortunate. So I, I think that helps, too. I really do. And that relationship that you have with DOT, is that, with all due respect, is that a political relationship? No. And what I mean by that is it depends on who's in office, or are we seeing a kind of a real change in thinking on DOT? Our Florida DOT has evolved a lot in my career. Uh, I'm 34 years now in this career. Um, they've gotten a lot better. Uh, they have policies in place that are as good as any in the nation. Um, so we give DOT a lot of crap, but they're actually a pretty good DOT compared to 49 other states. Um, it's not perfect, and, and there are things that they do that we don't always like, but it's a partnership. And uh, I think it's a technical relationship, a professional relationship, uh, but a lot of it is due to who is the secretary. Yeah, secretary uh, and that is a political relationship. Mm -hmm. So, he's, he's uh, but I think you need both. Yeah, I mean, we he- saw him here for right. the- for Yeah, the he, he yeah. came here and he's very empathetic. He listens well. Um, he is one of the least condescending and paternalistic secretaries of the DOT I've ever seen. That's why I don't feel like he is political. <laughs> right. okay. Well, and, and, and what I meant by political was temporary. Yeah. So yeah. you get the new secretary and all of a sudden that relationship shuts down. I've seen that, I've seen that happen. And, um, uh, and, and not here. Well, it did happen here. It happened for the better here when, when, when Secretary Gwynn came. Mm -hmm. So it is temporal to a degree, but I think they're in a much better place. They've got the policies, the framework in place. And we're not the only urbanized area doing the things we're doing. So there's a lot of other places around the state that are pushing and advocating for the same thing. Orlando, South Florida, you name it. Okay. Because one, one of the concerns, and one of many concerns, is that the, the, the switch to, to multimodal and making room for bicycle and all other forms of transportation is, certainly isn't new to the world or even the United States, but it's fairly new to us. We've been talking about it for 25 years, but we've only started to real, make real progress in the last five to, to eight to 10. Um, and so I think a lot of that is the public really doesn't know. And, and so it's a matter of money that's spent, and I certainly don't advocate for an open wallet. But when you start to say, almost saying you need to cut corners or w w widen that lane, who is it that's making those decisions, and when does the public get to say that wide bike lane is valuable and it needs to be part of that project? And, and, and how do we get that feedback to the residents to allow them to make that feedback back to us? Again, great question. Um, so I'll paint a little picture here. We're about to embark on the long range transportation plan, and don't focus on the year. It's, we currently have a 2045 long range plan. The next one will be 2050. 
but it is the foundation for all the projects that happen in the next five years. And if, if it's not in the long range plan, we can't do the project if it's federal or state funded. So it starts with the long range plan and there's extensive public engagement. We were at the Orange Festival, I think that's what you call it here. Um, yeah. you, know, um, yeah. you know, we, we put up little tents outside where the public is. We go where the public is and we ask them about what they wanna see happen in the community. We do surveys, all kinds of stuff. The next step is a corridor study, like the 580 corridor study. That's in the long range plan to do the 580 corridor study. So now they're doing the corridor study. So there's a, a now you drill down into a level of detail. And again, hopefully this fall, we'll have public workshops showing alternatives. <laughs> uh, that road has a speed of 45 miles an hour for most of it. If there's a bike lane on there, DOT policy now says the bike lane must be seven feet wide and it must be buffered. It must have protected bollards. Oh, so progress. what you have out there was a former policy. <laughs> so that's the how evolution happens. Then let's say you do the quarter study, that's still not an engineering project, that's still not a design. So then the next phase would be, okay, now we're gonna build segment from A to B or intersection improvement here. Then you'll have a design phase and the public can weigh in on that. So it seems like a long process and it can be a long it process. It is a long process. I mean, it can Bill take- 19, 2018 and we've only gotten one project that's gonna happen in a year from now. And that's because just money saying. money doesn't right. just- and I'm not work. complaining, right. but I'm just saying, look we at that- crosswalks. Look at that, yeah, yeah. we did get crosswalks. There are some things we can do quickly, but those tend to be low cost, cheaper projects. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Uh, now I'll get into just a little more detailed stuff. One, Neil, yesterday at your Ford Pinellas meeting, I, I liked his idea of what you should do with Howard Franklin. So I'm just going to throw that out there. So our board did not respond to that, but what he suggested was putting solar panels on that existing Howard Franklin Bridge span that the state is expecting to, is planning to demolish at a cost of $35 million. They're going to bury it in Tampa Bay. And instead of demolishing it, uh, his suggestion was to put solar panels and create it like the, the old Gandhi friendship trail where there was make a trail out of it. Uh, our board did not respond. Nobody commented on that. I was kind of thinking that somebody might say, okay, let's have a discussion about this, but maybe we'll have that discussion and bring that up. But if you wanted to uh, have the city of Dunedin weigh in on something like that, seed. just plant the seed. We just, you know, then, then, you know, I would have something to hang my hat on. <laughs> Understand, understand. The, the reason I was uh, asking about um, modern ideas, make sure they get it right. If we want to talk about uh, Skinner Boulevard and a complete street um, with two roundabouts, uh, we all know the discussion that happens on, on roundabouts and where everybody go, immediately goes is, is Clearwater Beach. And I was talking to somebody recently about uh, roundabouts and they mentioned, and I haven't been there, but I guess in Sarasota, they've got some roundabouts that may not be the best. And, and so my concern is because I'm an advocate for the roundabouts. So to me, it's incredibly important that this complete street, Skinner Mobart in Dunedin, is the best it can be, is as modern and forward thinking as it can be. And do you think it is, or if not, where those changes might be? Are we looking at those multimodal communities? There are some good ones in the United States. There's wonderful communities outside of the United States that are doing great things. Are we looking that far out? Even from traffic lights and how they look yep. to raised crosswalks or raised um, bike lanes? Yeah, we are. We always are looking for ideas you know. and case studies. Uh, Carmel, Indiana has 250 something roundabouts. Uh, it's like the roundabout capital of the world. Uh, we had their mayor come to Sarasota when we were planning those roundabouts on US 41 and talk about the benefits of the roundabouts that Carmel has had. And it saved them a ton of money with all the replacement they've done of traffic signals. You know, so it, it's cost savings. It keeps traffic flowing. I think roundabouts are incredibly safe. They don't eliminate crashes, but the crashes you have are much less impactful, much less serious. They're fender benders, if anything. Um, and and they're, they're safer for pedestrians and bicyclists. Now, context is everything. So we could spend hours talking about roundabouts. We won't do that. But I'm confident that the conceptual design I've seen is good and forward thinking and is the right treatments for the right location. I wouldn't recommend doing that everywhere. But that's for that segment of Skinner, I think it will fit. And we have a roundabout being constructed this year on Alt 19 in Palm Harbor at Florida Avenue. 
It'll be the first one on the state highway system in Pinellas County. I'm excited for that. To and, and that was one wherever we took a vote, 50% hated it and 50% loved it. And we never could get like a majority. It just depended on who showed up at the meeting. Uh, but finally we pushed through and it's, it's the best solution for that location. Okay. And the, uh, back to your Ford Pinellas meeting yesterday, uh, before I get on to other topics, and I'm sorry to take up everybody's time, but this is one of the few times we get to talk to Witt and Ford Pinellas. Um, your, the three county bus route you're trying to, trying to get through, and I understand that they're having some, some issues in Hillsborough. But as far as the, the Pasco Pinellas c connection, just because we have several uh, people who work in, in, in Dunedin or in North County but live actually in Pasco, so it's kind of a concern for me. Um, and there was also T. Barta did a um, bus rapid transit study, US 19. And I can't remember whether that was part of the whole triangle or that was a separate one, but I'm, I'm concerned or interested in the results of that study, that BRT study, and I had asked for um, a, a, a bus terminal, I guess, uh, at 580 and 19, mm -hmm. and just wanted to know where we are with that project. So the 580 quarter study will help with that. Okay. Um, get that idea in that plan first. Uh, T. Barta, Tampa Bay Regional Transit Authority, is studying the US-19 connection from State Road 52 in Pasco to the Gateway Airport area in Pinellas County to look at a rapid transit option running along US-19 with limited stops, express service, maybe dedicated lanes, and other treatments. Um, it, so it'll be like a uh, a lighter version of light rail. It's not rail, obviously, it's rubber tires. Um, that concept is still not developed yet. They're in the planning phase. Uh, I expect sometime this summer they'll start having an alternative that we can review and look at. And then they're going to come to Pinellas County and Pasco County and say, do you want to pay for it? Now, we can get federal and state funding for a portion of it, but there's always going to be a local commitment to operate and maintain and that's something that we've we struggled with Pinellas County to step up and do that. Well, frequency is always an issue, and yeah, with frequency we have to talk about density, and we have to. You know, and then the other one you mentioned was the Tri County plan, which uses 275 as the corridor between Pasco Hillsboro. Right. And the issue there is that um, that plan calls for additional lanes on I 275 north of downtown Tampa. And Hillsborough County is adamantly opposed to any additional capacity improvements to I-275. And they're on record supporting tearing down I-275 north of downtown Tampa and converting it into a boulevard, which is not a very popular idea, but it's got a lot of traction in the urban part of Tampa. And so that political divide right now is keeping them, I think, from supporting this regional project. And there's more to it than that, but that's, that's the conflict right now. Mm -hmm. So I'm less optimistic that we'll get that project funded in the near term, mm -hmm. just because of the political dynamics. The uh, 580 corridor uh, study that you're doing, uh, I'm an advocate for taking uh, Skinner Boulevard and just extending it all the way through. All right, so that's the way I see 580 is going, is, uh, which is a drastic change for 580 the way it is today. Is is that study or is that pre-designed focused concept, whatever you want to call it, is it, does it go to that extent or are you guys just thinking about slowing traffic down, putting in some medians, we've made, the we've, bush, we've, calling we've, it a day? We've made FDOT aware of that idea, that concept. Uh, one thing you have to remember though is that it's, it's on the state highway system and ultimately it's the state's road and we can, advise and make recommendations, uh, but their probably main concern in addition to safety is mobility. And if they see that as leading to a, a lot of congestion, then that probably wouldn't be an alternative the state would support. Mm -hmm. but, but that's something we can explore and, and we can certainly ask them to, to investigate that more fully. Uh -huh. But, but doing that then also allows you to use mixed use and yeah. increased density and increased public transit frequency and bike lanes and the concept is great you know. and I support your concept. I just know that you know those are difficult solutions when you're talking with FDOT on a state highway. And 
now my last one, and I promise it's the last one. I'm sorry, you guys have been so kind to me. Um, is alternate 19 in, in Curlew and uh, making sure we get that right, especially from a, a multimodal standpoint. Uh, we are getting, we, Dunedin is the most active part of the trail. Uh, it has been since day one, as far I've never seen it where we haven't been by far the most active use of the trail. Honeymoon Island is the most active visited state park in the state of Florida. So there's a lot of activity. We're about to get a brand new bridge that is going to include bike lanes and it's going to encourage uh, more, more bicycle use, more multimodal forms of transportation there. Uh, so how can I advocate for a floating roundabout <laughs> that you saw me post on Facebook. Yeah. I, I, I think it would work <laughs> for, for what it's supposed to do, but I also look at the Skyway Bridge as something that's iconic and a signature for, for West Florida, or West Central Florida. Um, St. Pete has a pier. Um, again, we are the most, at, we've got a state park, we've got number one, number two beaches, you know, at least in the top ten every year. We have a water tower that we're about to complete that's going to be uh, a wonderful art project in, in, in North Dunedin. And so I see, so I just think that that type of forward thinking, best use thought process, a floating round, roundabout works in that intersection. What is a floating <clears throat> It's a it's a concept from the Netherlands, I believe, Netherlands. Uh, where they have them in place. And it's not floating. It's actually connected to the ground. Uh, but there are ramps that get you up and allow you to traverse the intersection above grade. And then they take you down to a trail network on, on all the sides. That's probably a good location for it. It was also suggested at the Clearwater Roundabout, too, uh, by a former city council member who was on our board. Um, I would say that's going to be... The next phase of any improvements out there, that won't be included in what we're going to do in FY23 uh, because those funds are happening so soon and we've got $4 million and that would be a lot more than $4 million. But So we're not planning the ultimate improvement out there, but that's certainly something we can incorporate into the next long-range plan and then we could continue to advocate for it. And there's no funding in place for the Dunedin Bridges, uh, but maybe when we get funding in place for the Dunedin Bridges, then that could be a package as part of that. Okay. So any improvements in the near, ter near term for that intersection are going to be car-centric. It's for the cars. And so are there going to be any safety improvements for their pedestrians and bicyclists? There will be. Uh, I, think, I think they'll go hand-in-hand hand there. I wouldn't say it's completely car-centric, uh, but there is a congestion management approach here that's included, okay. as well as a safety approach. Okay. Because my, my concern, and, and I understand that that's a short term, it, yeah. so it's already there, but that's my concern about once they finish that, they're going to go, cool, we'll see you in at least 20, 25 years. And I just see, especially with the new bridge, that it's going gonna, it's gonna to beg people to be on their bicycles. Yeah. And, I think and, you're thinking good long-term perspective yeah. there. I appreciate that. Mm, my pleasure. Thank you. Thank everybody. Thank all of you guys for allowing me to do that. Just but it's beers Jennifer's fault. That piece of this. <laughs> yeah, beers with wit will work all the time. <laughs> I think he asked them all. I think he asked them all too. I, I mean, yeah. I mean, uh, and that, and that did I'm kind of speechless. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, no, and actually, I, I had spoken to Wit probably like a few weeks ago at length uh, because I had to speak to a, a group of citizens, so I was wanting to be up on all that, all the, uh, the goings on. So I don't really have any questions. I mean, I, I guess I'll just do the shout out for the, the speed uh, study on Alt-19. I, I turn off of there going home all the time. I see the violations. I hear it from my neighbors. It's, a, it's just a bad spot in that suicide lane. I mean, people violate it all the time. You wish a cop was right there to see them. Um, but um, so I, I just think that's really important. Um, other than that, uh, I, I wish I could ask something else, but I, I can't think of anything off the top of my head. But it's all right. you're doing an awesome job, and, and Mayor, shout out to you because I know you do a, a really great advocacy job for us on that board. So. And, and Mayor Kennedy, thank you. Commissioner Tonga. Thank you. 
Um, Whit, I know that you're concerned about uh, all forms of transportation. You know, a couple of us used to use the word uh, omni as opposed to multi, so everything from all the ways up and down. I know you're very concerned. Uh, by the way, if anybody's listening to this, he's a very serious bike rider. So, Cookie, and, 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 and uh, I, got, I got a couple questions that, that can be very specific. Um, first of all, about ITS, now, first, so everybody knows this, there's no more acronyms in the business than what is in this business over here. So let me just say, intel let's just use intelligent traffic system lights then. Where are we with that? Have we progressed uh, uh, with that? I mean, because that's a, that's a way to, uh, to settle traffic down some. Um, people don't get anxious when, when that's working, if it's working properly. Uh, is it? Currently, have we, are we at a higher level than, than we have been in the past? I, we... Well, I think Pinellas County is still a leader statewide in intelligent transportation systems. The county just won a $5 million federal grant um, to expand uh, the intelligent transportation system network to Gulf to Bay and Druid, or Drew, I'm sorry, Drew Street, Gulf to Bay, and the southern portions of US-19. Um, that federal grant will allow um, interoperability between cars and signal systems, and it'll also allow um, the signal systems and the cars to detect pedestrian and bicycle movement and predictive analytics so that if somebody is moving toward an intersection, it's going to anticipate that they're going to that intersection to cross, and it'll adapt the signals and adjust for safety and actually give warnings to drivers in their cars that pedestrians are approaching. The technology is getting there. It's really close for, it's called connected vehicle technology. And this $5 million grant will begin to deploy that. It's, um, it's, it's recognition of different obstacles and conflicts that might be in the vehicle's path. And we don't yet have that in Pinellas County. So this grant will introduce to the, to us to that state of the art. We do have adaptive signals on 580 and on East Bay Drive. Um, they work reasonably well, but the, the challenge in Pinellas County is adapting the signals to congestion when, it, when you're congested and all four approaches is really difficult. So how much more green time do you give Belcher versus 580? Certain times of the day, it doesn't do any good to give any more green time to the other. You're just going to have more delay. That's why they have a massive computer there trying to figure out right. what's happening. But all those cameras predictive. all over Pinellas yeah. County feed into that system, and that's what that system uses. So we're state-of-the-art, um, I think, and have been for 20 years. We have a dedicated funding source for that, which is a penny out of the gas tax. Uh, but this federal grant will be a game-changer, I think. And we'll, so we'll see more of that, and that's going to be helpful to yeah. us. One of the jokes is when you, hold your, when you drive up, you hold your pen up. And then the light changes, and everybody thinks you changed the you changed the light, right? But but you didn't. But but somebody is trying to control that. But we don't have enough of that, uh, as we as we know. Uh, that's that's going to become I, more. I appreciate the next appreciate that comment. Um, we talked at one point in time, and, and we used the word um, for our alt night alt nineteen as a scenic road. And you remember those when we were talking to all the different communities up, and some have a scenic road, and for some it's not so right. scenic. We're really scenic, yeah. um, very scenic. And we, we had talked about with, with that change of, of the speed limit, we would be automatically sort of pushing some people up towards 19 or towards, uh, towards County Road 1 or towards the Belcher Roads. Has there been any more thought about that? Is that in this concept of attempting to, to slow some of that traffic down to some degree? I think that's something we'll take into account, is the effect it'll have on the whole system, the network. Um, you know, if you're pushing vehicles to other roadways. That's why when we looked at the truck routing study, we recommended against further restrictions of truck traffic because uh, it would push that probably to County Road 1, which is more residential. And um, also, a lot of the destinations are right on Alt 19 and not on County Red 1. Um, so we, we do try to think of that systems approach. 
I don't know if it's as granular as you're looking at there, but okay. Um, so there's really been no no really. I, I think if we action. took it down to 30 miles an hour, I don't think you're going to see such a huge effect of shifting cars to 19 or to County Road One, honestly. Uh, but for a truck traffic, if you restricted trucks, they would have to go to these other roads, and that's a different deal. Um, just a big long-term uh, concept here. We're talking about all these aut uh, autonomous vehicles, and we're doing a lot of testing on that. It's going very, very slow, yeah. and n not a whole lot of it's happening. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to not only, not only from a protective standpoint or safety standpoint, but we're trying to, we're trying to eliminate some of the traffic on the road when and where we can. And I see how slow we're going here. Um, are you seeing any communities other in other places that, in Cook, I don't mean just in Florida here, but it, maybe in other places that, that are really moving that along a lot more rapidly than what well, we autonomous are? Autonomous vehicles? No. The, the concept of, of what we're trying to do with it, they're um, not? I think the concept is, is, is being worked on in private and public. Uh, you know, Elon Musk and other people like that you've heard of. I'm really not optimistic about autonomous vehicles doing anything much until 2045 or 50 or whenever. I think there's too much at risk, and I think it's really high bar. And I think even the industry is now, nobody's really saying we're going to have fully autonomous vehicles in 5 or 10 or 15 years. You're going to have some limited autonomy, and maybe it'll start with trucks and buses and things like that. But even so, I don't, I, I, you know, you all had the AVA here for a little while, the autonomous vehicle. It's coming back next month. Yeah, and, you know, in a low-speed, uh, controlled environment, maybe those things can, can take hold uh, in, in piece by piece, but you're not going to see widespread autonomy for a long, so, long time, so let me, if ever. So let me try to summarize what you're saying then, I think, because I'm frustrated by it a little bit. And so... As what you've seen, the test that just went on in Clearwater again, and now we're going to come back here and we're going to test it here with some high hopes of perhaps that being utilized. But you're saying something like that, just that single concept. I'm not talking about the rest of us driving around with autonomy because everybody's working on it as we all and They have been for years, as we all know. All the big shots, all the big guys, and there's major companies that have whole units just, just for this. From the, our standpoint of trying to control some of this traffic in here, we probably shouldn't rely too much on that off uh, into the media. I mean, I think it's a neat idea, future. and I think it'll have some benefits, especially on Douglas. Um, but I just don't think you're going to have um, widespread deployment. Okay. So I think you'll be looking at individual projects like that, and that's perfectly fine. But it's not going to be a, a panacea for congestion. It's just not. Vision Zero. Are you talking about parking, too? Are you talking about as far as... Um, people going around and around in circles and trying to find parking and things like that. Um, I, I think that it's gonna, there's going to have to be multiple different solutions. You know, maybe that's one, but then maybe there's some kind of a technology where, where people, you know, right now there's a prototype that St. Pete Beach is using, Indy Rocks Beach is looking at it, where somebody was wanted to come with their family to Dunedin, and all of a sudden they'd be able to look at a map and see... Well, there's one parking space, you know, in downtown. There's yeah. none over here, or there's none, period, today. It's called parking sensors. Mm -hmm. And the technology is called, the one that they have is called Libium, L-I, or I don't know if I'm saying right, but it's L-I-B-E-L-I-U-M. And um, so I'm thinking that it's going to take multiple things. It's not going to be just one. Yep. One, I, you know, just not just the autonomous cars. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, last comment about Vision Zero. And you know how big I was about this, yes. big time. Um, on Vision Zero, now I noticed that we've gone to changing some of our, our or your organization, should I say, or our organization, Forward Pinellas, has Everybody's. gone. Yeah, you're part of it. <laughs> has gone to, to changing it just a little bit. Before we were saying, hey, look, let's have, let's have no Vision Zero, no deaths right now. We don't want any deaths. Whatever we have to do to stop a death, we don't want anybody. Certainly, it all sounds good. And so now we're changing just a little bit. That's okay. But here's my question. Vision Zero has been around for a bit now, and it was, it was actually at a federal level, correct? Now is it at a federal level. Now. Has, has anybody come up? What, what, is the, what is the best thing that we could utilize today in all of Pinellas, so that we're all familiar with it, that we can use here in Dunedin then, 
Um, we've come up with our own little things, you know, uh, drive friendly Dunedin and because we're dog friendly Dunedin and all of that kind of thing. But how can we, if we did nothing more than save one, two, three, particularly if it's your life, uh, that would be pretty cool. Um, I know, Whit, you were involved in a serious bike accident not too long ago. Not too serious. <laughs> I survived. You could not be here. If it, but anyway, so what, what, what can we do? What, is your organization working on something? Yeah. Well, we've got Safe Streets Pinellas, and uh, wow. we are working on that. We've set aside funding for the next phase uh, of implementing it. Uh, you know, we've got a pilot program on speed management, and I think speed management is one of the big things we can do. Um, you know, people drive impaired and people um, are distracted, but the big contributing cause of fatalities and injuries is speeding. And if we can manage that, uh, there was a bill in the legislature I don't think is going to pass that would have allowed school districts to adopt um, speed enforcement in school <clears throat> zones, which means you could use cameras to write tickets for people who went over 15 miles an hour in school zones. We supported that bill. We think that's a good way to start with safety in a very vulnerable area. And I know, Mayor, you were instrumental in getting those uniform speed limits in school zones. And, you know, that's one thing we could do that would have a big impact, especially in off-peak periods. Because on 580, when I leave this meeting, I'll see people going 60 miles an hour down that road. Oh, hell yeah. You know, not in, not in rush hour, but in off-peak. And that's where you, and it's night, it's dark. So that's where you have most of our injuries and fatalities happen at night in poorly lit areas. What we, we uh, I've laughingly have said, and I use this myself now frequently, is, and that's just the concept of just chill. I've talked about that from <laughs> yeah. up here. Everybody just chill. So when you're driving along and your uh, golf cart's in front of you, and uh, we all say, well, what's that guy doing there? And I, and I say to myself, I literally do, just chill and step back and just, it's okay. I do know that when I talked with, with DOT several years ago, they had, they had a program um, and, and a concept about the speed control and or about Vision Zero. They um, still do. Yeah. Do they still have that? Absolutely. Should, should we all be jumping on that? Should your organization be stuffing we, that? We're partnering with shifting, them on that. That's, that's the same pilot program we're doing. All right. Well, thank you. Yeah, we're building on that. Make sure we do that, would you? Thank you. Help us. Yes, no, and, and, and even in your community, maybe too, they have uh, advocates from Vision Zero. I'm sure they would come and, and talk so, because most of us know what it is, but do your residents know what Vision Zero is? Do they know that it's from another country and that it came here? And that, you know, one of the, in Chicago, the gentleman that you and I met, uh, he was instrumental because that was one of the worst cities in the country with fatalities and the innovative ideas they did in that community to eliminate and very successfully uh, the deaths there. And, and you know, so it, it's a good idea to bring some of these to, to your community and have them, you know, have your residents get a chance to interact. Jeff was asking one of the questions, how do we make all of this stuff happen so everything gets done this way? One of them is through the concept of vision zero. And Absolutely. you don't do anything without taking all of that into consideration for all modes of transportation. And when you do that, and that's what you guys do. I know, I know well, you do And that. all the ideas that you brought up, I mean, the slowing the traffic so that it's all, you know, every it's all comparable. Everybody's, you know, it's all the same. Uh, everything that you want to do with the roundabout, those are all great pieces that will add to the charm and, and the safety of Dunedin. Thank you. I, 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 I did want to. I love being with question. you guys. You got you asked such awesome questions. This is so great. See, I told you we needed to do this. <laughs> <laughs> they are good questions. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you um, Whit, uh, we've been having a bunch of questions about the trail markings. It's been all over our social media. When we just post, posted your graphic of keep right, everybody went ballistic yeah. and said, that's not what it's, that's not the way it's supposed to happen. So well, can you just please say what's supposed to happen or, or the change that's getting ready to happen? I think, I think Commissioner Gow said it best. Change is hard. Uh, so we've had 25, well, 30 years the Pinellas Trail's been open, right? Um, so when the county first designed the trail, they, in parts of the trail, uh, particularly through here in Dunedin, 
they segmented it into a separate section for people to walk and to ride bikes. And there were real concerns. Like when this trail opened, what was the big thing at the time? Uh, rollerblades. Yeah. They were really concerned about mixing rollerblades. Well, you don't have that concern anymore like you did in 1990. So things have evolved. And every other trail network in the U.S. has this slower to the right, pass to the left. And they don't segregate pedestrians and bicyclists like the Pinellas Trail does. And the county has determined that they would like to evolve and move in the way that all the other trails are being designed around the state of Florida and elsewhere. And they've, um, you know, they've actually talked about filling in the grass strip between those separate areas. But the county doesn't have much money for the trail program. Uh, it's out of the parks department. They're funded out of general. <coughs> So change is really slow um, to modifications to the trail just because they don't have much funding. So they have a plan in place to change the markings, just like they have a plan in place to change the signage to allow for the recognition of electric bikes. Uh, but they've been slow to implement some of that. And I think it contributes to a lot of the confusion and a lot of the frustration. They were very angry yeah. today and yesterday on that <laughs> post. I mean, angry like... We're telling them there's going to be a change happening, and they basically told us we were full of you-know-what. Well, the county is eventually going like, to make no? those changes. They are going to make those changes. Well, I think we need to know when and oh, how no, and right. what yeah. because we'll we're, we're trying to communicate to people what to do, and, but yet these systems aren't in place. Yeah, so in the meantime, I, I think Commissioner Tornga had it best is chill and relax and try to be respectful of others because it's I, 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 it's very congested out there at times. I'm just telling you there, we, we shouldn't be posting those graphics then on social media if we're not changing the signs and all of that stuff on the actual trail because every time we post something about the trail, it, it, it literally becomes an argument. Every the, single time. The trail is not uniform <coughs> in Pinellas County. So the county puts out those graphics, and they're not necessarily speaking just to Dunedin. So they, I get the, it. Those graphics but cover they, Then Seminole, they need to put money towards Portland. it. Yep. I think the trail is very underfunded, personally. I agree. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. I have a couple gifts because you have a little pen here. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you, Matt. Thank you. Thank you, Wit. Thank you, Wit. Thank you, Wit. No. Thank you, Wit. Thank you, very much. Thank you, Cookie. Mm -hmm. Yes. I didn't even get to say it. I have been close friends with Deborah for almost 20 years. So what do you and this guy? Yeah. Great questions. Good for you. All right. See you later, Cookie. All right. We'll get back to uh, the rest of our agenda. How about if we do um, the historical thing and the um, second, second reading of the waterways, and then we'll take a break? Yes. I'm okay to forge through and be done. But you know what? Because it doesn't look like any well, of them are that big. But. Well, the last one might be. I don't know. It's really just approving negotiation. But okay. That's just I'm, me, but I'll, know, I'll go with the flow. I just want to say that these people have been waiting a long yeah. time to celebrate. So. <laughs> yeah, okay. I know. All right, so we'll uh, go to action items. Second reading of Ordinance 2201, Historical Landmark Designation for 255 Garden Circle North. Nikki, please, would you please read Ordinance 2201 by title only? Ordinance 2201, an ordinance of the City of Dunedin, Florida, designating the home located at 255 Garden Circle North as a historic landmark and providing for an effective date. And this has been reading of Ordinance 2201 on second reading by title only. I have a motion to approve. So moved. Second. Okay. Vice Mayor and Commissioner Tornga, thank you. Hi, Molly. Hi. Hi, everyone. <laughs> uh, Molly Cord on behalf of Community Development. Uh, we have a second reading of Ordinance 2201 for the local historic landmark designation at 255 Garden Circle North. Uh, it's part of the R60 single-family residential zoning district. Uh, it's a non-special flood hazard area. Uh, let's see. This is the aerial vicinity. Um, you can see it, just a little bit of the map over here. I'm trying to keep it as uh, short and sweet as possible. Um, just to kind of give you guys uh, some history about the Millards, the structure was built in 1941 and was historically utilized as the residential home of Bruce and Nellie Millard. 
Uh, the Millards were active members of the Dunedin community, where Bruce was an active member of the D Dunedin Masonic Lodge 192 and ran for Dunedin City Commission in 1944. Uh, Nellie was an active member of the Eastern Star Chapter 132 and the Dunedin Garden Club. Nellie was also recognized as successfully creating Dunedin's first victory garden and producing the city's first compost pile. Uh, this is the front elevation of the home, just to give you an idea. And these are the side elevations of the home. Uh, the current owners tonight, uh, Rob and Claudia Walker, would like to designate this property as a historic landmark to celebrate the history of its inhabitant, inhabitants that displayed community leadership and service to the development of Dunedin. Uh, staff finds the request consistent with the applicable review criteria, and therefore the staff recommendation is to approve Ordinance 2201. Uh, I'd really love to mention how wonderful Rob and Claudia have been through this entire process. Uh, they are just delightful people to work with, uh, so knowledgeable. Um, I usually do all the research, and Claudia was just amazing with what she was able to come up with. I know she's not going to speak tonight, but I'm just putting the plug for her. She has just been fantastic through this entire process. So I really want to give this platform to the applicants at this time. Uh, Rob, if you want to come up. Welcome. <laughs> Hi, welcome. Well, it should only take about 45 more minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I prepared a few more. Tonight we were prepared. Yeah. And then Jeff has questions after that. <laughs> <laughs> that is a nice shirt. Yeah, <laughs> that's an issue. Yeah, I might have to put on my sunglasses. <laughs> um, well, first of all, uh, just really want to thank Molly for everything that she has done. And her efforts are amazing. and really was instrumental to the success of this. So anyway, I want to say thank you, Molly. You're welcome. Um, so uh, Claudia and I are honored and humbled by this designation. Um, we applaud the city efforts to preserve the history and <coughs> architecture which defines this community. Our first visit to Dunedin culminated a five-year journey for us. And within the same time frame that a home in Dunedin stays on the market, we decided to pack up our Subaru and leave California for a new life here in Dunedin. Uh, there are many things about Dunedin that make this town special. Chief among those are the commitment to community and the absolutely great people that live here. We have made so many good friends. And we have so many great neighbors, some of which are in attendance tonight. And uh, in our short time here, um, you know, we wake up every morning feeling like we have won the lottery by, by being here. A uh, special thank you to Dave and Pam Dawson for agreeing to pass the stewardship of this property mm -hmm. to us. Um, and we were honored by that decision and we were honored by their friendship as well. Our home is truly a living memorial to the cultural, political, social, economic, architectural history spanning nearly a century of events and achievements that shaped our community, subsequently making Dunedin what it is today. Um, we'd be remiss if we didn't say that this designation is, is really not about us. It's about the role that we all play in being the caretakers and stewards of our history and community values. We, like all the previous residents, had a role in the preservation of the home, which has spanned several generations that experienced the growth of, of country and the town of Dunedin. Uh, we want to reiterate that we strongly support the city's efforts to preserve the history and architecture of our neighborhoods. So thank you for all that you have done in terms of pushing this forward. And I'm glad Dale was here. <laughs> um, so thank you again. Uh, we are very proud to be part of this great community. And uh, just as an aside, uh, you all are invited to Sterling Winery to join us in a celebratory toast. Meeting and adjourned. <laughs> <laughs> Watch out, she's going to get the electric wheelchair next and be down there in five seconds. <laughs> so, 
You hit Deborah's button. Yeah, <laughs> yeah the meeting's over. Yeah. Talk wide. Thank you. Thank you very thank much. You very much. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. We, we want to thank you. On behalf of the chairmanship of the Historic Preservation Committee, we are very pleased to give this family the plaque for their home. And truly, the family and the house fit together well for Dunedin. So very we're good. very proud to present this to them. Very good. Thank you. OK. Uh, any questions for staff? Any other public input? All right. Uh, we have a motion and a second on the floor. Uh, all in favor? Oh, no. Roll call. Sorry. Commissioner Franey? Aye. Aye. Commissioner Gow? Aye. Commissioner Tornga? Aye. Vice Mayor Kynes? Aye. Mayor Brzezowski? Aye. And that motion passes un unanimously. Congratulations. <laughs> Okay, I, mean, I, I do need a break now, and they're all going to be leaving. Yeah, they're all going to be leaving, so let's take a little break right now. I know, okay. I know.
motion? So moved. Second. Okay, Commissioner Twonga Third. and Vice Mayor. Okay. Fourth. Come on, Jay. I don't have anything to add from we'll the initial the <laughs> first reading. This is the same fix to appropriately refer to the slip user as such, consistent with the agreement. Okay. Any questions? No, good change. This is a public hearing. Anyone wishing to come forward and speak to this item, feel please feel free to do so. Please make my Seeing or hearing none, come back to the commission. Any final comments? Nope. Roll call vote, please. Commissioner Franey? Aye. Commissioner no, Cowell? Aye. Vice Mayor Kynes? Aye. Commissioner Torn? Aye. Mayor Bajowski? Aye, and that motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Now we have a start item um, to preliminary, to give preliminary approval uh, to negotiate or renegotiate um, an amendment to the development agreement between Gateway, Dunedin LLC, and the City of Dunedin. I need a motion to add this to the agenda. So moved. Second. Okay, uh, Commissioner Gao and Vice Mayor. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. And we will, Joey? I don't know. <laughs> George? Uh, I, I, I'll Jennifer? start there. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Somebody put Joey on my cheat sheet, so I, so I figured it was you. It's okay. Joey's here to, to answer any questions. Um, so, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Commissioners, the City Commission approved the development agreement for the for, for Gateway uh, previously, and um, at, at this juncture, the um, the uh, um, owner of the property, uh, Gateway LLC, would like to amend that development agreement. And there are two principal points uh, that, that is the, the letters attached, the request is attached to your agenda item, two principal points. He has acquired property to the north of the uh, previously approved uh, area that was encompassed by the development agreement. And also, um, he so we need to change the legal description of the approved development agreement and also is requesting additional density. I'm requesting uh, uh, approval of the city commission today to uh, begin negotiations with the, with the uh, with the owner of the property, in terms of of um, amending that development agreement. And simply that's it. We're not prepared to discuss the development agreement itself tonight or the request this evening. But per code, uh, you do have to authorize me to negotiate uh, with the owner of the property. What is the expiration of this development agreement? It's June of 2022. So, essentially, three months from now. It is yes. Does it extend that time? No. It does not. Okay. Um, that is one of the matters that they that can be discussed if authorized to move forward tonight. And and I do believe that's been brought up in the written request to the to the commission as well. We can look at the effective date um, of the uh, development agreement itself extending the time. Can the applicant yeah, come on? Good evening, everyone. Um, I think we would all really hate to see this development agreement time extended. I mean, we would like to see the construction right away. I understand that. Is that and the I've intent? Got construction documents complete in the back of my truck, uh, ready to be submitted. Um, if you read my letter, um, it was my position that this was a non-material um, change that wouldn't require an amendment to the development agreement because the the footprint of the building is the same, the height of the building is the same, the length of the building is the same, the width of the building is the same. Um, you know, I, I purchased soggy bottom uh, property during the downturn. I, I did you know, increase the footprint. Um, frankly, I assumed this would be a much smoother process, so I directed uh, the design team to go from 81 units to 90 units, uh, even though with the land I would be entitled to 92 apartment units, but I could get to 90 without making anything bigger. I split um, two bedrooms into two one bedrooms. Um, I split a three bedroom into a two bedroom and a one bedroom. Um, I, I created units that, uh, based on our feasibility study, were you know more efficient and easier to rent. Um, so uh, the traffic study is being amended to reflect the additional units. The, uh, let's see what else, the parking calculations, uh, everything that I have currently ready to submit to, to George and Joey are based on the- The 10 additional units. Yes, nine. Nine, sorry. Um, so, you know, this shouldn't be, you know, I was more frustrated 
that we have to go through this process, but I do respect that it is a process and that, and I do respect, you know, in Nikki's opinion and, 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 and so I guess to answer your question, now on the other hand, um, you know, we're going to submit the documents when this is complete. Um, I do believe that the effective date of the ordinance should be the new date, but we'll talk about, you know, because, you know, any way you look at it, you know, I, you know, I was amazed to see that we requested the development agreement in April of 2020, so two years ago, uh, almost, um, you know, and we've been through, you know, pandemics and record inflation and wars, and I'm waiting for like locusts to come oh, to, you know. All we're, that's all we're, that's all we're missing. That's all the thing we're missing. And, and half of me is like, this, this is like another obstacle that, that for some reason or another, um, I believe we're gonna overcome. I'm excited about the project. Um, the costs have gone up significantly that we're trying to figure our way through that. Uh, but that is not because of project creep. It's just because, you know, the price of steel, the price of concrete, the price of everything has gone up. And we're trying to manage those costs without compromising, you know, any of the finishes on the design, which we're not. We actually went the wrong way. There's a lot more brick than probably um, anticipated. And we're using things like structural brick, structural brick for the um, stair towers, for example, that'll have a brick veneer on both sides. Uh, so there's a lot of things that we're doing there, but whether it's the feasibility, oh, I was here for two days with uh, uh, the feasibility stu study uh, consultant from C.B. Richard Ellis from Atlanta. And, you know, it happened that we got that Southern Living article at the time that I'm hanging with these guys and they're, they're reviewing, um, you know, the feasibility of the project. So uh, everything, all the boxes are checked as far as the location, as far as the occupancy, as far as the projections for revenues. Um, the only real wrench is cost of construction uh, and, and now this kind of little hurdle that we've got to get through. But I definitely need those nine units. It makes sense. We incorporated the soggy bottom parking lot. We're going to now pave and improve the parking lot. We're going to get more spaces. Uh, when we met there, you know, a year ago maybe, um, you know, we're going to have some parallel parking between soggy bottom now and the drive, which is the hotel uh, kind of service drive. And we'll have now an exit, instead of that being a dead end, uh, for, you know, dumpsters and things where they'd have to pull in off Main Street and back out, which was the original plan. Now they're going to pull in, empty the dumpster, and pull right out onto Skinner and get out. So it's, it just made a lot of sense to incorporate the soggy bottom property into the overall project. <laughs> but like it or not, it is a different legal description. It is a different site plan. The site plan has already been submitted. Um, and, um, and like I said, I have all the plans, I have all the drawings done, so. Okay, well, it's just, I know since it's been, well, over 12 months since we approved the project, probably 15, 16 yeah. months, 15 months, um, cause it's an 18 month, right? So. I know, but those, I, I know, but it wasn't like, I mean, there, there happened to be a pandemic in the middle of it and everything kind of shut down and, and everyone that was, even remotely interested in either financing or getting involved in it kind of pulled away to the point where, you know, I was going to finance the hotel on my own, but now there actually is a lot of interest in financing the hotel again. So, you know, I get it. it it's been a, a two year blur um, and I want to build this as much as anybody else. And I haven't changed my mind to build it or my commitment to build it. Um, Okay, I just wanted all of that on the record. And we had two, I was just gonna, uh, you know, there, this was one of the larger, um, projects including the city's involvement. We had the two <clears throat> property transfers that occurred timely, actually a month early under the agreement. We had a deadline to, to do those property swaps. Um, I think after it was approved in, in October, we had to get them done within six months and we got and, and we worked with Joe to get those done a month early. So those property swaps were a big part too of, of being able to um, get to this point. So I just didn't wanna you all have been through a lot in those two years, and that was another big, big piece of it. So, um, just and I, but I do think Mayor and I hear your comments, and I know Jennifer will take them as well. That you know, I obviously the process to amend the development agreement because it has to be the same process and give public notice as when you entered into the development agreement does present a you know even if we are able to work expediently a slight you know delay before be able to move forward with some of the things that he's ready for. So I, I do recognize that, but it is your code and that's what we're following. 
and making sure the public gets that same notice that they got when, when the development agreement was entered into initially. Yeah, I just think it's, I'm, I'm, I think I'm speaking for all of us. Um, you know, we don't, we don't, I don't want to see this drag on. I want to see bulldozers in the ground. That property, not, and it's not just you. We've been sitting with that property for 15, 16 years, 17 years, actually. It was, so. I agree. There's some things. You nothing know, happening. And one issue that we have to overcome is there's a 24-inch stormwater line that's on the property that's not in the right-of-way. It's actually on the property, so that is going to need to get relocated. We have to work that out with, with the city. Um, I'm learning my lesson. You know, my first development agreement ever was the artisan, and I listed a certain amount of parking spaces, and then all of a sudden you have columns and things as the design evolves, because the development agreement is based on schematics. And then all of a sudden I got into this whole issue with the exact amount of parking spaces. The same thing now with this one, I, I made the parking spaces a little bit more flexible in the development agreement, but I didn't catch that we had a, a, an amount of units where, it, in my opinion, you know, at least if I thought about it, I would have said as many as I'm allowed for d density wise. Uh, but, you know, that's water under the bridge. But now, for example, you know, I, I would like to discuss when this comes up with the city manager, you know, how are we going to handle the moving a 24 inch line that's the city's line off my property? Um, or can I just demolish it? You know, which that's not really uh, an option. Uh, but there's things like that that we will need to work out. Um, you know, and it, I hate to say, I mean, I get it. You know, nobody more than me wants to get this thing built. I, I hate that I'm going to be starting it now in the, you know, in the, in the rainy season um, and in the middle of a war and in the middle of the record inflation. And, you know, so I am trying to work through that stuff. And I'm not going to build this if it's going to, you know, you know, if it's going to get to the point where it's frankly just not worth it. I'm not at that point. I come to meetings like this. I see what's going on with Ford Pinellas. I see, you know, the commitment to Dunedin that the couple had when they just, you know, dedicated their home to the to uh, to be, the historic, the historic register. Yeah. You know, I see all that, and you recognize. And I read the article like I read last night from Southern Living. You know, except my daughters had to tell me what Star Willows was because I didn't watch Gilmore Girls. <laughs> uh, but uh, but one way or another, you know, I get it, and I'm still committed. You know, I hate having to go through this obstacle. And I, and I can tell you right now, if the city manager asked me for another development agreement fee, I'm not doing it. Because there's simple things like that that are just, in my mind, I get that we need to protect the city's interest. I get that you need to ensure that I'm not changing the elevations or bait and switch. You know, I understand why the city attorney has her um, requirements to fulfill. But on the other hand, if the building looks the same, if the building isn't bigger, if it's not taller, and if I have the parking and I have, you know, the traffic study updated, um, this shouldn't be a big deal. And, and if this issue didn't come up, you would have had a set, Joey would have had 200 pounds of drawings on his desk, you know. But Jorge's working with us on the 24-inch stormwater line. Uh, staff is going through it, the civil already. So, uh, and okay. then that's kind of where it is. I'm ready to make a motion. Okay, go right ahead. Yes. Make the motion. I did. I said You're yes. moving to go into negotiations, right? Oh, yes. so I'll second that motion. Okay. okay. I'll second yes. that. Vice Mayor and Commissioner Franey, thank you. I have, I have a question. Mm -hmm. Is there any? Is there any way? I'm just asking for all of us. Is there any way that we can? You can amend your code if you want to change your... That, that is the only way. We'd, yes. we'd, we'd have to amend the code. Is there any other way that we can sort of facilitate? Because as, as the mayor is saying, she'd like to move along. You can, amend, you it, can amend your code. I can't change what the code is. That's the only way. That is the only thing we could do. And, and, the, and then the stat development agreement statute says you have to have a minimum of two public readings right. on any amendment. Correct. So you could shorten your code for amendments right now, which requires three to two. <laughs> But that's the only way to shorten the time period for amendments. And, is and there anything the city? We don't, I was going to say, we don't have to see the project again, right, if there's no physical change. It's just the development agreement. That's correct. That's all, yes. That's Pictures are all the same. Is there anything, right. Is okay. there anything that we can do 
for the city manager to help her in this process that she may not want to ask for, but, but the mayor is saying we would like to speed the, you know, we want to make sure we're doing this as quickly as we can. I'm just asking. I don't understand that the, the, the legal answer to your question is authorized tonight for us to be able to move forward. That's what the city manager needs. I, I understand. No, I understand. No. I I'm, can't say what she. I'm, no, here. Then let me uh, let me ask. Uh, then let me address address it to her. Is there anything that we can do to help you, that that you're aware of? I'm. I have to ask. If I don't ask, we don't know. No, there's not. Okay. The, the, the but I, I had to say that uh, Joe had mentioned that he won't pay the five thousand dollar fee. That's in the code. The city commission yeah. can waive it, yeah. but that's in the code. Okay. So we're going to have to talk about that. But uh, this is a request to authorize, and I'd like you. That's what I'm asking you to do. We have got to, per code, uh, hit those steps. What I've committed to Joe to do is to do that as expediently as possible, with me working with staff to get the documents through for, for the development agreement itself. There's one reading before the, the LPA, which we have got to hold, and two before the city commission, so we need to move that forward as quickly as we can. The onus is on, is on city staff as well. Um, you know, I mean, Joey did a fantastic job of getting this development agreement before you today as a start item. Um, so uh, predicated upon the letter that Joe had sent. So um, uh, there's nothing, Commissioner, thank you, that you can do to help me. We, um, uh, we as staff need to, to you know, and I think that, that we need to understand that there's a workload issue here as well in reviewing these plans. I mean, 400 pounds of plans have to be reviewed by, you know, by, by the planners and, and in, in every aspect and in every discipline as well. So, I mean, we're pushing as hard as we can as well to get this, um, you know, to, to reach fruition, if you will, and get shovels in the ground by June. I would like to see a groundbreaking in June. Well, that said, I mean, we will do our best, but we gotta, we've got to adhere to the code. Both no, the Florida we will. Building code and our code mm -hmm. of order. But I'm, obviously, I mean, I'm just, obviously, you know how to prioritize everything, but I just want it to be loud and clear. So Top my, priority. So my, Top priority. So my business experience, I heard somebody say something that may be a conflict. And do we need that resolution tonight? Or this do we is a request to authorize. Joe and I will negotiate if you authorize that. Thank you. And we'll arrive at a recommendation for all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we. Uh, anybody from the public wish to speak to this item? Seeing or hearing none, we'll come back to the commission. Any final comments? No. Okay. Roll call vote, please. Commissioner Tornga? Aye. Commissioner Kynes? Aye. Commissioner Franey? Aye. Vice Mayor Gow? Aye. Mayor Bischowski? Aye. That motion passes unanimously. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Joe. All right. Uh, then we've got our, um, what you call it, proposed agenda. Everybody okay with everything on there? Mayor. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, Mayor. Um, yes. I, since it looks like a light agenda, though an exciting item, a light agenda, I was wondering if the commission would like for me to add the um, referendum election ordinance first reading to your March 24th agenda. The, is, what's the dream report? You, we haven't seen that yet, or have we? I yeah, thought we You did. have seen it at a workshop, yeah. Oh. Yeah, the to dream, you remember? That? Right, yeah. yeah. The option of the dream. Uh, master yes. plan. Yeah, but that's going to take a while to talk about. <coughs> okay, if that's not, if, if you don't think so, that's fine. I, we can look for No, we can do one. it. No, we because when, don't we have a certain date certain that we need to get all these yes, but referendums <coughs> in? To you, have, you have substantial amount of time still, but that's why I was just asking. Yeah, go ahead. But, okay, we'll go ahead and Rebecca and we'll add that one. You put that Thank you, Mayor. Okay. Okay, can I have a, um, with that addition, can I have a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. Second. Vice Mayor, Commissioner Gao, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously, and we are adjourned. Thank you for watching this City of Dunedin government meeting. If you'd like to review any part of this meeting or watch any previous government meeting coverage, you can watch these meetings online anytime through the city's website, DunedinGov.com. Stay connected with everything Dunedin.
follow the city on this channel and on the city's Facebook page, through Twitter, and on the city's YouTube channel. Thanks again for watching this Dunedin Television production.